Chapter Eleven of Theophrastus Such by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Middledorf. Chapter Eleven: The Wasp Credited with the Honeycomb. No man, I imagine, would object more strongly than Euphorion to communistic principles in relation to material property, but with regard to property and ideas, he entertains such principles willingly and is disposed to treat the distinction between mine and thine in original authorship as egoistic, narrowing, and low. I have known him, indeed, to insist at some expense of erudition in the poor right of an ancient, a medieval or an eighteenth-century writer, to be credited with a view or a statement lately advanced with some show of originality, and his championship seems to imply a nicety of conscience toward the dead. He is evidently unwilling that his neighbors should get more credit than is due to them, and in this way he appears to recognize a certain proprietorship, even in spiritual production. But perhaps it is no real inconsistency that, with regard to many instances of modern origination, it is his habit to talk with a Gallic largeness and refer to the universe. He expatiates on the diffusive nature of intellectual products, free and all-embracing as the liberal air on the infinitesimal smallness of individual origination compared with the massive inheritance of thought on which every new generation enters, on that growing preparation for each epoch through which certain ideas or modes of view are said to be in the air and, still more metaphorically speaking, to be inevitably absorbed so that everyone may be excused for not knowing how he got them. Above all, he insists on the proper subordination of the irritable self, the mere vehicle of an idea or combination which, being produced by the sum total of the human race, must belong to that multiple entity, from the accomplished lecturer or popularizer who transmits it to the remotest generation of Fugians or Hottentots, however indifferent these may be to the superiority of their right above that of the eminently perishable dyspeptic author. One may admit that such considerations carry a profound truth to be even religiously contemplated, and yet object all the more to the mode in which Euphorion seems to apply them. I protest against the use of these majestic conceptions to do the dirty work of unscrupulosity and justify the non-payment of conscious debts which cannot be defined or enforced by the law. Especially since it is observable that the large views as to intellectual property, which can apparently reconcile an able person to the use of lately borrowed ideas as if they were his own, when this spoliation is favored by the public darkness, never hinder him from joining in the zealous tribute of recognition and applause to those warriors of truth whose triumphal arches are seen in the public ways those conquerors whose battles and annexations even the carpenters and bricklayers know by name. Surely the acknowledgment of a mental debt which will not be immediately detected and may never be asserted is a case to which the traditional susceptibility to debts of honor would be suitably transferred. There is no massive public opinion that can be expected to tell on these relations of thinkers and investigators relations to be thoroughly understood and felt only by those who are interested in the life of ideas and acquainted with their history. To lay false claim to an invention or discovery which has an immediate market value, to vamp up a professedly new book of reference by stealing from the pages of one already produced at the cost of much labor and material, to copy someone else's poem, and send the manuscript to magazine, or hand it about among friends as an original effusion, to deliver an elegant extract from a known writer as a piece of improvised eloquence. These are the limits within which the dishonest pretense of originality is likely to be hissed or hooted and bring more or less shame on the culprit. It is not necessary to understand the merit of a performance or even to spell with any comfortable confidence in order to perceive at once that such pretenses are not respectable. But the difference between these vulgar frauds, these devices of ridiculous jays, 
whose ill-secured plumes are seen falling off them as they run, and the quiet appropriation of other people's philosophic or scientific ideas, can hardly be held to lie in their moral quality unless we take impunity as our criterion. Pitiable jays had no presumption in their favor and foolishly fronted an alert incredulity. But Euphorian, the accomplished theorist, has an audience who expect much of him and take it as the most natural thing in the world that every unusual view which he presents anonymously should be due solely to his ingenuity. His borrowings are not incongruous feathers awkwardly stuck on. They have an appropriateness which makes them seem an answer to anticipation, like the return phrases of a melody. Certainly one cannot help the ignorant conclusion of polite society, and there are perhaps fashionable persons who, if a speaker has occasion to explain what the occipant is, will consider that he has lately discovered that curiously named portion of the animal frame. One cannot give a genealogical introduction to every long-stored item or fact or conjecture that may happen to be a revelation for the large class of persons who are understood to judge soundly on a small basis of knowledge, but Euphorian would be very sorry to have it supposed that he is unacquainted with the history of ideas and sometimes carries even into minutia the evidence of his exact registration of names in connection with quotable phrases or suggestions. I can therefore only explain the apparent infirmity of his memory in cases of larger conveyance by supposing that he is accustomed by the very association of largeness to range them at once under those grand laws of the universe in the light of which mine and thine disappear and are resolved into everybody's or nobody's, and one man's particular obligations to another melt untraceably into the obligations of the earth to the solar system in general. Euphorian himself, if a particular omission of acknowledgment were brought home to him, would probably take a narrower ground for explanation. It was a lapse of memory, or it did not occur to him as necessary in this case to mention a name, the source being well known, or since this seems usually to act as a strong reason for mention, he rather abstained from adducing the name because it might injure the excellent matter advanced, just as an obscure trademark casts discredit on a good commodity, and even on the retailer who has furnished himself from a quarter not likely to be esteemed first-rate. No doubt this last is a genuine and frequent reason for the non-acknowledgment of indebtedness to what one may call impersonal as well as personal sources. Even an American editor of school classics, whose own English could not pass for more than a syntactical shoddy of the cheapest sort, felt it unfavorable to his reputation for sound learning that he should be obliged to the penny cyclopedia and disguised his reference to it under contractions in which u.s nal took the place of the lowly words penny works of this convenient stamp easily obtained and well nourished with matter are felt to be like rich but unfashionable relations who are visited and received in privacy and whose capital is used or inherited without any ostentatious insistence on their names or places of abode. As to memory, it is known that this frail faculty naturally lets drop the fact which are less flattering to our self-love when it does not retain them carefully as subjects not to be approached, marshy spots with a warning flag over them. But it is always interesting to bring forward eminent names such as Patricius, or Scaliger, Euler, or Lagrange, Bop, or Humboldt. To know exactly what has been drawn from them is erudition and heightens our own influence, which seems advantageous to mankind, whereas to cite an author whose ideas may pass as higher currency under our own signature can have no object except the contradictory one of throwing the illumination over his figure when it is important to be seen oneself. All these reasons must weigh considerably with those speculative persons who have to ask themselves whether or not universal utilitarianism requires that in this particular instance before them they should injure a man 
who has been of service to them, and rob a fellow workman of the credit which is due to him. After all, however, it must be admitted that hardly an accusation is more difficult to prove, and more liable to be false, than that of a plagiarism which is the conscious theft of ideas and deliberate reproduction of them as original. The arguments on the side of acquittal are obvious and strong. The inevitable coincidence of contemporary thinking and our continual experience of finding notions turning up in our minds without any label on them to tell us whence they came, so that if we are in the habit of expecting much from our own capacity, we accept them at once as a new inspiration. Then, in relation to the elder authors, there is the difficulty first of learning and then of remembering exactly what was wrought into the backward tapestry of the world's history together with the fact that ideas acquired long ago reappear as the sequence of an awakened interest or a line of inquiry which is really new in us. Whence it is conceivable that if we were ancients, some of us might be offering grateful hetacombs by mistake and proving our honesty in a ruinously expensive manner. On the other hand, the evidence on which plagiarism is concluded is often of a kind which though much trusted in questions of erudition and historical criticism, is apt to lead us injuriously astray in our daily judgments, especially of the resentful, contemporary sort. How Pythagoras came by his ideas, whether St. Paul was acquainted with all the Greek poets, what Tacitus must have known by hearsay and systematically ignored, these are points on which a false persuasion of knowledge is less damaging to justice and charity than an erroneous confidence supported by reasoning fundamentally similar of my neighbor's blameworthy behavior in a case where I am personally concerned. No premise requires closer scrutiny than those which lead to the constantly echoed conclusion, he must have known, or he must have read, I marvel that this facility of belief on the side of knowledge can subsist under the daily demonstration that the easiest of all things to the human mind is not to know and not to read. To praise, to blame, to shout, grin, or hiss, where others shout, grin, or hiss, these are native tendencies. But to know and to read are artificial, hard accomplishments concerning which the only safe supposition is that as little of them has been done as the case admits. An author keenly conscious of having written can hardly help imagining his condition of lively interest to be shared by others. Just as we are all apt to suppose that the chill or heat we are conscious of must be general, or even to think that our sons and daughters, our pet schemes, and our quarreling correspondence are themes to which intelligent persons will listen long without weariness. But if the ardent author happen to be alive to practical teaching, he will soon learn to divide the larger part of the enlightened public into those who have not read him and think it necessary to tell him so when they meet him in polite society, and those who have equally abstained from reading him but wish to conceal this negation and speak of his incomparable works with that trust in testimony which always has its cheering side. Hence it is worse than foolish to entertain silent suspicions of plagiarism, still more to give them voice, when they are founded on a construction of probabilities which a little more attention to everyday occurrences as a guide in reasoning would show us to be really worthless, considered as proof. The length to which one man's memory can go in letting drop associations that are vital to another can hardly find a limit. It is not to be supposed that a person desirous to make an agreeable impression on you would deliberately choose to insist to you with some rhetorical sharpness on an argument which you were the first to elaborate in public. Yet anyone who listens may overhear such instances of obliviousness you naturally remember your peculiar connection with your acquaintance's judicious views, but why should he? Your fatherhood, which is an intense feeling to you, is only an additional fact of meager interest for him to remember, and a sense of obligation to the particular living fellow-struggler who has helped us in our thinking 
is not yet a form of memory the want of which is felt to be disgraceful or derogatory unless it is taken to be a want of polite instruction or causes the missing of a cockade on a day of celebration in our suspicions of plagiarism we must recognize as the first weighty probability that what we who feel injured remember best is precisely what is least likely to enter lastingly into the memory of our neighbors but it is fair to maintain that the neighbor who borrows your property loses it for a while and, and when it turns up again forgets your connection with it and counts it his own shows himself so much the feebler in grasp and rectitude of mind some absent persons cannot remember the state of wear in their own hats and umbrellas and have no mental check to tell them that they have carried home a fellow visitor's more recent purchase they may be excellent householders far removed from suspicion of low device but one wishes them a more correct perception and more wary sense that a neighbor's umbrella may be newer than their own true some persons are so constituted that the very excellence of an idea seems to them a convincing reason that it must be if not solely yet especially theirs it fits in so beautifully with their general wisdom it lies implicitly in so many of their manifested opinions that if they have not yet expressed it because of preoccupation it is clearly a part of their indigenous produce and is proved by their immediate eloquent promulgation of it to belong more naturally and appropriately to them than to the person who seemed first to have alighted on it and who sinks in their all originating consciousness to that low kind of entity a kind of second cause this is not lunacy not pretense but a genuine state of mind very effective in practice and often carrying the public with it so that poor columbus is found to be a very faulty adventurer and the continent is named after amerigo lighter examples of this instinctive appropriation are constantly met with among brilliant talkers Aquila is too agreeable and amusing for any one who is not himself bent on display to be angry at his conversational rapine his habit of darting down on every morsel of booty that other birds may hold in their beaks with an innocent air as if it were all intended for his use and honestly counted on by him as a tribute in kind hardly any man i imagine can have had less trouble in gathering a showy stock of information than Aquila. On close inquiry, you would probably find that he had not read one epoch-making book of modern times, for he has a career which obliges him to much correspondence and other official work, and he is too fond of being in company to spend his leisure moments in study. But to his quick eye, ear, and tongue, a few predatory excursions in conversation where there are instructed persons gradually furnish surprisingly clever modes of statement and allusion on the dominant topic when he first adopts a subject he necessarily falls into mistakes and it is interesting to watch his gradual progress into fuller information and better nourished irony without his ever needing to admit that he has made a blunder or to appear conscious of correction suppose for example he had incautiously found some ingenious remarks on a hasty reckoning that nine thirteens make a hundred and two and the insignificant bantam hitherto silent seemed to spoil the flow of ideas by stating that the product could not be taken as less than a hundred and seventeen aquila would glide on in the most graceful manner from a repetition of his repetitious remark to the continuation all this is on the supposition that a hundred and two were all that could be got out of nine thirteens but all the world knows that nine thirteens will yield etc proceeding straight away into a new train of ingenious consequences and causing bantam to be regarded by all present as one of those slow persons who take irony for ignorance and who would warn the weasel to keep awake how should a small-eyed feebly crowing mortal like him be quicker in arithmetic than the keen-faced forcible aquila in whom universal knowledge is easily credible 
looked into closely the conclusion from a man's profile voice and fluency to his certainty in multiplication beyond twelves seems to show a confused notion of the way in which very common things are connected but it is on such false correlations that men found half their inferences about each other and high place of trust may sometimes be held on no better foundation it is commonplace that words writings measures and performances in general have qualities assigned them not by a direct regard on the performances themselves but by a presumption of what they are likely to be considering who is the performer we all notice in our neighbors this reference to names as guides in criticism and all furnish illustrations of it in our own practice for check ourselves as we will the first impression for any sort of work must depend on a previous attitude of mind and this will constantly be determined by the influence of a name but that our prior confidence or want of confidence in given names is made up of judgments just as hollow as the consequent praise or blame they are taken to warrant is less commonly perceived though there is a conspicuous indication of it in the surprise or disappointment often manifested in the disclosure of an authorship about which everybody has been making wrong guesses no doubt if it has been discovered who wrote the vestiges many an ingenious structure of probabilities would have been spoiled and some disgust might have been felt for a real author who made comparatively so shabby an appearance of likelihood it is this foolish trust in prepossessions founded on spurious evidence which makes a medium encouragement for those who happening to have the ear of the public give other people's ideas the advantage of appearing under their own well-received name while any remonstrance from the real producer becomes an embarrassment to each person who has paid complimentary tribute in the wrong place hardly any kind of false reasoning is more ludicrous than this on the probability of origination it would be amusing to catechize their guessers as to their exact reasoning for thinking their guess likely why hoopo of john's has fixed on toucan of magdalene why shrike attributes his peculiar style to buzzard who has not hitherto been known as a writer why the fair columbia thinks it must belong to the reverend merula and why they are all alike disturbed in their previous judgment of its value by finding that it really came from skunk whom they had either not thought of at all or thought of as belonging to a species excluded by the nature of the case clearly they were all wrong in their notion of the specific conditions which lay unexpectedly in the small skunk and in him alone in spite of his education nobody knows where in spite of somebody's knowing his uncles and cousins and in spite of nobody's knowing that he was cleverer than they thought him such guesses remind one of a fabulist's imaginary council of animals assembled to consider what sort of creature had constructed a honeycomb found and much tasted by bruin and other epicures the speakers all started from the probability that the maker was a bird because this was the quarter from which a wondrous nest might be expected for the animals at that time knowing little of their own history would have rejected as inconceivable the notion that a nest could be made by a fish and as to the insects they were not willingly received in society and their ways were little known several complimentary presumptions were expressed that their honeycomb was due to one of the other admired and popular birds and there was much fluttering on the part of the nightingale and swallow neither of whom gave a positive denial their confusion perhaps extending to their sense of identity but the owl hissed at this folly arguing from his particular knowledge that the animal which produced honey must be the muskrat the wondrous nature of whose secretions required no proof and in the powerful logical procedure of the owl from musk to honey was but a step some disturbances arose hereupon for the muskrat began to make himself obtrusive believing in the owl's opinion of his powers and feeling that he could have produced the honey if he had thought of it until an experimental butcher bird proposed to anatomize him as a help to decision the hubbub increased the opponents of the muskrat 
inquiring who his ancestors were until a diversion was created by an able discourse of the macaw on structures generally which he classified as to include the honeycomb entering into so much admirable exposition that there was a prevalent sense of the honeycomb having probably been produced by one who understood it so well but bruin who had probably eaten too much to listen with edification grumbled in his low kind of language that fine words butter no parsnips by which he meant to say that there was no new honey forthcoming perhaps the audience generally was beginning to tire when the fox entered with his snout dreadfully swollen and reported that the beneficent originator in question was the wasp which he had found much smeared with undoubted honey having applied it to his nose whence indeed the able insect perhaps justifiably irritated at what seems to be a scepticism had stung him with some severity an infliction renard could hardly regret since the swelling of a snout normally so delicate would corroborate his statement and satisfy the assembly that he had really found the honey-creating genius the fox's admitted acuteness combined with the visible swelling were taken as undeniable evidence and the revelation undoubtedly met a general desire for information on a point of interest nevertheless there was a murmur the reverse of delighted and the feelings of some eminent animals were too strong for them the orangutan's jaw dropped so as seriously to impair the vigour of his expression the edifying pelican screamed and flapped her wings the owl hissed again the macaw became loudly incoherent and the gibbon gave his hysterical laugh while the hyena after indulging in a more splenetic guffaw agitated the question whether it would be not better to hush up the whole affair instead of giving public recognition to an insect whose produce it was now plain had been much overestimated but this narrow-spirited motion was negatived by the sweet-toothed majority a complimentary deputation to the wasp was resolved on and there was a confident hope that this diplomatic measure would tell on the production of honey End of chapter 11. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 12 of Theophrastus Such by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Middledorf. Chapter 12. So young. Ganymede was once a girlishly handsome, precocious youth that one cannot for any considerable number of years go on being youthful girlishly handsome and precocious seems on consideration to be a statement as worthy of credit as the famous syllogistic conclusion socrates was mortal but many circumstances have conspired to keep up in ganymede the illusion that he is surprisingly young he was the last born of his family and from his earliest memory was accustomed to being commended as such to the care of his elder brothers and sisters. He heard his mother speak of him as her youngest darling, with a loving pathos in her tone which naturally suffused his own view of himself, and gave him the habitual consciousness of being at once very young and very interesting. Then the disclosure of his tender years was a constant matter of astonishment to strangers who had had proof of his precocious talents, and the astonishment extended to what is called the world at large when he produced a comparative estimate of European nations before he was well out of his teens. All comers on a first interview told him that he was marvelously young, and some repeated the statement each time they saw him all critics who wrote about him called attention to the same ground for wonder his deficiencies and excesses were all alike to be accounted for by the flattering fact of his youth and his youth was the golden background which set off his many-hued endowments he was already enough to establish a strong association between his sense of identity and his sense of being unusually young but after this he devised and founded an ingenious organization for consolidating the literary interests of all the four continents subsequently including australasia and polynesia he himself presiding in the central office 
which thus became a new theatre for the constantly repeated situation of an astonished stranger in the presence of a boldly scheming administrator found to be remarkably young. If we imagine with due charity the effect on Ganymede, we shall think it greatly to his credit that he continued to feel the necessity of being something more than young, and did not sink by rapid degrees into a parallel of that melancholy object, a superannuated youthful phenomenon. Happily, he had enough of valid, active faculty to save him from that tragic fate. He had not exhausted his fountain of eloquent opinion in his comparative estimate, so as to feel himself, like some other juvenile celebrities, the sad survivor of his own manifest destiny, or like one who has risen too early in the morning and finds all the solid day turned into a fatigued afternoon. He has continued to be productive both of schemes and writings, being perhaps helped by the fact that his comparative estimate did not greatly affect the currents of European thought, and left him with the stimulating hope that he had not done his best but might yet produce what would make his youth more surprising than ever. I saw something of him through his Antinous period, that time of rich chestnut locks, parted not by a visible white line, but by a shadowed furrow from which they fell in massive ripples to right and left. In these slim days he looked the younger for being rather below the middle size, and though at last one perceived him contracting an indefinable air of self-consciousness, a slight exaggeration of the facial movements, the attitudes, the little tricks, and the romance in shirt-collars, which must be expected from one who, in spite of his knowledge, was so exceedingly young, it was impossible to say that he was making any great mistake about himself. He was only undergoing one form of a common moral disease, being strongly mirrored for himself in the remark of others. He was getting to see his real characteristics as a dramatic part, a type to which his doings were always in correspondence. Owing to my absence on travel and to other causes, I had lost sight of him for several years. But such a separation between two who have not missed each other seems, in this busy century, only a pleasant reason when they happen to meet again in some old accustomed haunt for the one who has stayed at home to be more communicative about himself than he can well be to those who have all along been in his neighborhood. He had married in the interval, and as if to keep up his surprising youthfulness in all relations, he had taken a wife considerably older than himself. It would probably have seemed to him a disturbing inversion of the natural order that any one very near to him should have been younger than he, except his own children, who, however young, would not necessarily hinder the normal surprise at the youthfulness of their father. And if my glance had revealed my impression on first seeing him again, he might have received a rather disagreeable shock, which was far from my intention. My mind, having retained a very exact image of his former appearance, took note of unmistakable changes such as a painter would certainly not have made by way of flattering his subject. He had lost his slimness, and that curved solidity which might have adorned a taller man was a rather sarcastic threat to his short figure. The English branch of the Teutonic race does not produce many fat youths, and I have even heard an American lady say that she was much disappointed at the moderate number and size of our fat men, considering their reputation in the United States. Hence a stranger would now have been apt to remark that Ganymede was unusually plump for a distinguished writer, rather than unusually young. But how is he to know this? Many long-standing prepossessions are as hard to be corrected as a long-standing mispronunciation, against which the direct experience of eye and ear is often powerless and I could perceive that Ganymede's inwrought sense of his surprising youthfulness had been stronger than the superficial reckoning of his years and the merely optical phenomena of the looking-glass. He now held a post under government, and not only saw, like most subordinate functionaries, how ill everything was managed, but also what were the changes that a high constructive ability would dictate and in mentioning to me his own speeches and other efforts toward propagating reformatory views in his department, 
he concluded by changing his tone to a sentimental head voice and saying but i am so young people object to any prominence on my part i can only get myself heard anonymously and when some attention has been drawn to the name is sure to creep out the writer is known to be young and things are none the forwarder well said i youth seems the only drawback that is sure to diminish you and i have seven years less of it than when last we met ah returned ganymede as lightly as possible at the same time casting an observant glance over me as if he were marking the effect of seven years on a person who had probably begun life with an old look and even as an infant had given his countenance to that significant doctrine the transmigration of ancient souls into modern bodies i left him on that occasion without any melancholy forecast that his illusion would be suddenly or painfully broken up i saw that he was well victualled and defended against a ten years siege from ruthless facts and the course of time observation convinced me that his resistance received considerable aid from without each of his written productions as it came out was still commented on as the work of a very young man one critic finding that he wanted solidity charitably referred to his youth as an excuse another dazzled by his brilliancy seemed to regard his youth as so wondrous that all other authors appeared decrepit by comparison and their style such as might be looked for from gentlemen of the old school able pens according to a familiar metaphor appeared to shake their heads good-humouredly implying that ganymede's crudities were pardonable in one so exceedingly young such unanimity amid diversity which a distant posterity might take for evidence that on the point of age at least there could have been no mistake was not really more difficult to account for than the prevalence of cotton in our fabrics ganymede had been first introduced into the writing world as remarkably young and it was no exceptional consequence that the first deposit of information about him held its ground against facts which however open to observation were not necessarily thought of it is not so easy with our rates and taxes and need for economy in all directions to cast away an epithet or remark that turns up cheaply and to go in expensive search after more genuine substitutes there is high homeric precedent for keeping fast hold of an epithet under all changes of circumstance and so the precocious author of the comparative estimate heard the echoes repeated young ganymede when an illiterate beholder at a railway station would have given him forty years at least besides important elders sachems of the clubs and public meetings had a genuine opinion of him as young enough to be checked for speech on subjects which they had spoken mistakenly about when he was in his cradle and then the midway parting of his crisp hair not common among english committeemen formed a presumption against the ripeness of his judgment which nothing but a speedy baldness could have removed it is but fair to mention all these outward confirmations of ganymede's illusion which shows no sign of leaving him it is true that he no longer hears expressions of surprise at his youthfulness on a first introduction to an admiring reader but this sort of external evidence has become an unnecessary crutch to his habitual inward persuasion his manners his costume his suppositions of the impression he makes on others have all their former correspondence with the dramatic part of the young genius as to the incongruity of his contour and the other little accidents of physique he is probably no more aware that they will affect others as incongruities than armida is conscious how much her rouge provokes our notice of her wrinkles and causes us to mention sarcastically that motherly age which we should otherwise regard with affectionate reverence but let us be just enough to admit that there may be old young coxcombs as well as old young coquettes end of chapter 12 this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 13 of theophrastus such by george eliot this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by josh middledorf chapter 13 
how we come to give ourselves false testimonials and believe in them. It is my way, when I observe any instance of folly, any queer habit, any absurd illusion, straightway to look for something of the same type in myself, feeling sure that amid all difference there will be a certain correspondence, just as there is more or less correspondence in the natural history, even of continents widely apart and of islands in opposite zones. No doubt men's minds differ in what we may call their climate or share of solar energy, and a feeling or tendency which is comparable to a panther in one may have no more imposing aspect than that of a weasel in another. Some are like a tropical habitat in which the very ferns cast a mighty shadow, and the grasses are a dry ocean in which a hunter may be submerged. Others, like the chilly latitudes in which your forest tree, fit elsewhere to prop a mine, is a pretty miniature suitable for potting. The eccentric man might be typified by the Australian fauna, refuting half our judicious assumptions about what nature allows. Still, whether fate commanded us to thatch our persons among the Eskimos or to choose the latest thing in tattooing among the Polynesian Isles, our precious guide, Comparison, would teach us in the first place by likeness, and our clue to further knowledge would be resemblance to what we already know. Hence, having a keen interest in the natural history of my inward self, I pursue this plan I have mentioned of using my observation as a clue or lantern by which I detect small herbage or lurking life, or I take my neighbor in his least becoming tricks or efforts as an opportunity for luminous deduction concerning the figure the human genus makes in the specimen which I myself furnish. Introspection, which starts with the purpose of finding out one's own absurdities, is not likely to be very mischievous, yet of course it is not free from dangers any more than breathing is, or the other functions that keep us alive and active. To judge of others by oneself is in its most innocent meaning the briefest expression for our only method of knowing mankind. Yet we perceive it has come to mean, in many cases, either the vulgar mistake which reduces every man's value to the very low figure at which the valuer himself happens to stand, or else the amiable illusion of the higher nature misled by too generous construction of the lower. One cannot give a recipe for wise judgment. It resembles appropriate muscular action, which is attained by the myriad lessons in nicety of balance and of aim that only practice can give. The danger of the inverse procedure, judging of self by what one observes in others, if it is carried on with much impartiality and keenness of discernment, is that it has a laming effect, enfeebling the energies of indignation and scorn, which are the proper scourges of wrongdoing and meanness, and which should continually feed the wholesome restraining power of public opinion. I respect the horsewhip when applied to the back of cruelty, and think that he who applies it is a more perfect human being because his outleap of indignation is not checked by a too curious reflection on the nature of guilt, a more perfect human being because he more completely incorporates the best social life of the race which can never be constituted by ideas that nullify action. This is the essence of Dante's sentiment. It's painful to think that he applies it very cruelly. E cortesia fi lui esser villiano. And it is undeniable that a too intense consciousness of one's kinship with all frailties and vices undermines the active heroism which battles against wrong. But certainly nature has taken care that this danger should not at present be very threatening. One could not fairly describe the generality of one's neighbors as too lucidly aware of manifesting in their own persons the weaknesses which they observe in the rest of Her Majesty's subjects. On the contrary, a hasty conclusion as to schemes of providence might lead to the supposition that one man was intended to correct another by being most intolerant of the ugly quality or trick which he himself possesses. 
doubtless philosophers will be able to explain how it must necessarily be so, but pending the full extension of the a priori method, which will show that only blockheads could expect anything to be otherwise, it does seem surprising that Heloisa should be disgusted at Laura's attempts to disguise her age, attempts which she recognizes so thoroughly because they enter into her own practice that Semper, who often responds at public dinners and proposes resolutions on platforms, though he has a trying gestation of every speech and a bad time for himself and others at every delivery, should yet remark pitilessly on the folly of precisely the same course of action in Ubique, that Aliquis, who lets no attack on himself pass unnoticed, and for every handful of gravel against his windows sends a stone in reply, should deplore the ill-advised retorts of Quispiam, who does not perceive that to show oneself angry with an adversary is to gratify him. To be unaware of our own little tricks of manner, or our own mental blemishes and excesses, is a comprehensible unconsciousness. The puzzling fact is that people should apparently take no account of their deliberate actions, and should expect them to be equally ignored by others. It is an inversion of the accepted order. There it is the phrases that are official and the conduct or privately manifested sentiment that is to be taken to be real. Here it seems that the practice is taken to be official and entirely nullified by the verbal representation which contradicts it. The thief, making a vow to heaven of full restitution, and whispering some reservations, expecting to cheat omniscience by an aside, is hardly more ludicrous than the many ladies and gentlemen who have more belief, and expect others to have it, in their own statement about their habitual doings, than in the contradictory fact which is patent in the daylight. One reason of the absurdity is that we are led by a tradition about ourselves, so that long after a man has practically departed from a rule or principle, he continues innocently to state it as a true description of his practice, just as he has a long tradition that he is not an old gentleman, and is startled when he is seventy at overhearing himself called by an epithet which has only applied to others. A person with your tendency of constitution should take as little sugar as possible, said Pilulus to Bovis somewhere in the darker decades of this century. It has made a great difference to Avis since he took my advice in that matter. He used to consume half a pound a day. God bless me, cries Bovis. I take very little sugar myself. Twenty-six large lumps every day of your life, Mr. Bovis, says his wife. No such thing, exclaims Bovis. You drop them into your tea, coffee, and whiskey yourself, my dear, and I count them. Nonsense, laughs Bovis, turning to Pilulus, that they may exchange a glance of mutual amusement at a woman's inaccuracy. But she happens to be right. Bovis had never said inwardly that he would take a large allowance of sugar, and he had the tradition about himself that he was a man of the most moderate habits, hence, with this conviction, he was naturally disgusted at the saccharine excesses of Avis. I have sometimes thought that this facility of men in believing that they are still what they once meant to be, this undisturbed appropriation of a traditional character which is often but a melancholy relic of early resolutions, like the worn and soiled testimonial to soberness and honesty carried in the pocket of a tippler whom the need of a dram has driven into peculation, may sometimes diminish the turpitude of what seems a flat, barefaced falsehood. It is notorious that a man may go on uttering false assertions about his own acts till he at last believes in them. Is it not possible that sometimes in the very first utterance there may be a shade of creed-reciting belief, a reproduction of a traditional self which is clung to against all evidence? There is no knowing all the disguises of the lying serpent. When we come to examine in detail what is the sane mind in the sane body, the final test of completeness seems to be a security of distinction between what we have professed and what we have done, what we have aimed at and what we have achieved, what we have invented and what we have witnessed or had evidenced to us. 
what we think and feel in the present and what we thought and felt in the past i know that there is a common prejudice which regards the habitual confusion of now and then of it was and it is of it seemed so and i should like it to be so as a mark of high imaginative endowment while the powers of precise statement and description are rated lower as the attitude of an everyday prosaic mind high imagination is often assigned or claimed as if it were a ready activity in fabricating extravagances such as are presented by fevered dreams or as if its possessors were in that state of inability to give credible testimony which would warrant their exclusion from the class of acceptable witnesses in a court of justice so that a creative genius might fairly be subjected to the disability which some laws have stamped on dicers and slaves and other classes whose position was held perverting to their sense of social responsibility this endowment of mental confusion is often boasted of by persons whose imaginativeness would not otherwise be known unless it were by the slow process of detecting that their descriptions and narratives were not to be trusted callista is always ready to testify of herself that she is an imaginative person and sometimes add an illustration that if she had taken a walk and seen an old heap of stones on her way the account she would give on returning would include many pleasing particulars of her own invention transforming the simple heap into an interesting castellated ruin this creative freedom is all very well in the right place but before i can grant it to be a sign of unusual mental power i must inquire whether on being requested to give a precise description of what she saw she would be able to cast aside her arbitrary combinations and recover the objects that she really perceived so as to make them recognizable by another person who passed the same way otherwise her glorying imagination is not an addition to the fundamental power of strong discerning perception but a cheaper substitute and in fact i find on listening to callista's conversation that she has a very lax conception even of common objects and an equally lax memory of events it seems of no consequence to her whether she shall say that a stone is overgrown with moss or with lichen that a building is of sandstone or of granite that melibius once forgot to put on his cravat or that he always appears without it that everybody says so or that one stockbroker's wife said so yesterday that philemon praised euphemia up to the skies or that he denied knowing any particular evil of her she is one of those respectable witnesses who would testify to the exact moment of an apparition because any desirable moment will be as exact as any other to her remembrance or who would be the most worthy to witness the action of spirits on slates and tables because the action of limbs would not probably arrest her attention she would describe the surprising phenomena exhibited by the powerful medium with the same freedom that she vaunted in relation to the old heap of stones her supposed imaginativeness is simply a very usual lack of discriminating perception accompanied with a less usual activity of misrepresentation which if it had been a little more intense or had been stimulated by circumstance might have made her a profuse writer unchecked by the troublesome need of veracity these characteristics are the very opposite of such as yield a fine imagination which is always based on a keen vision a keen consciousness of what is and carried the store of definite knowledge as material for the construction of its inward visions witness dante who is at once the most precise and homely in his reproduction of actual objects and the most soaringly at large in his imaginative combinations on a much lower level we distinguish the hyperbole and rapid development in descriptions of persons and events which are lit up by humorous intention in the speaker we distinguish this charming play of intelligence which resembles musical improvisation on a given motive where the farthest sweep of curve is looped into relevancy by an instinctive method from the florid inaccuracy or helpless exaggeration which is really something commoner than the correct simplicity often deprecated as prosaic even if high imagination were to be identified with illusion 
there would be the same sort of difference between the imperial wealth of illusion which is informed by industrious submissive observation and the trumpery stage property illusion which depends on the ill-defined impressions gathered by capricious inclination as there is between a good and a bad picture of the last judgment in both these the subject is a combination never actually witnessed and in the good picture the general combination may be of surpassing boldness but on examination it is seen that the separate elements have been closely studied from real objects and even where we find the charm of ideal elevation with wrong drawing and fantastic color the charm is dependent on the selective sensibility of the painter to certain real delicacies of form which confer the expression he longed to render for apart from this basis of an effect perceived in common there could be no conveyance of aesthetic meaning by the painter to the beholder in this sense it is as true to say of fra angelico's coronation of the virgin that it has a strain of reality as to say so of a portrait by rembrandt which also has its strain of ideal elevation due to rembrandt's virile selective sensibility to correct such self-flatterers as Callista, it is worth repeating that powerful imagination is not false outward vision, but intense inward representation, and a creative energy constantly fed by susceptibility to the veriest minutia of experience, which it reproduces and constructs in fresh and fresh holes, not the habitual confusion of provable fact with the fictions of fancy and transient inclination, but a breadth of ideal association which informs every material object every incidental fact with far-reaching memories and stored residues of passion bringing into new light the less obvious relations of human existence the illusion to which it is liable is not that of habitually taking duck ponds for lilied ponds but of being more or less transiently and in varying degrees so absorbed in ideal vision as to lose the consciousness of surrounding objects or occurrences and when that rapt condition is passed the same genius discriminates clearly between what has been given in this parenthetic state of excitement and what he has known and may count on in the ordinary world of experience dante seems to have expressed these conditions perfectly in that passage of the burgatorio where after a triple vision which has made him forget his surroundings he says quando l'anima mia torna di fuori alle cose che son fuori di le vere lo riconobbi i miei non falsi errori he distinguishes the ideal truth of his entranced vision from the series of external facts to which his consciousness has returned isaiah gives us the date of his vision in the temple the year that king uzziah died and if afterwards the mighty winged seraphim were present to him as he trod the streets he doubtless knew them for images of memory and did not cry look to the passers-by certainly the seer whether prophet philosopher scientific discoverer or poet may happen to be rather mad his powers may be have been used up like don quixote's in their visionary or theoretic constructions so that the reports of common sense fail to affect him or the continuous strain of excitement may have robbed his mind of its elasticity it is hard for our frail mortality to carry the burden of greatness with steady gait and full alacrity of perception but he is the strongest seer who can support the stress of creative energy and yet keep that sanity of expectation which consists in distinguishing as dante does between trosi che son vere outside the individual mind and the non falsi errori which are the revelations end of chapter 13 this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 14 of theophrastus such by george eliot this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by josh middledorf chapter 14 the too ready writer one who talks too much hindering the rest of the company from taking their turn and apparently seeing no reason why they should not rather desire to know his opinion or experience in relation to all subjects 
or at least to renounce the discussion of any topic where he can make no figure, has never been praised for this industrious monopoly of work which others would willingly have shared in. However various and brilliant his talk may be, we suspect him of impoverishing us by excluding contributions of other minds, which attract our curiosity the more because he has shut them up in silence. Besides, we get tired of a manner in conversation, as in painting when one theme after another is treated with the same lines and touches. I begin with a liking for an estimable master, but by the time he has stretched his interpretation of the world unbrokenly along a palatial gallery, I have had what the cautious Scotch mind would call enough of him. There is monotony and narrowness already to spare in my own identity. What comes to me from without should be larger and more impartial than the judgment of any single interpreter. On this ground, even a modest person, without power or will to shine in the conversation, may easily find the predominating talker a nuisance while those who are full of matter on special topics are continually detecting miserably thin places in the web of that information which he will not desist from imparting. Nobody that I know of ever proposed a testimonial to a man for thus volunteering the whole expense of the conversation. Why, then, is there a different standard of judgment with regard to a writer who plays much the same part in literature as the excessive talker plays in what is traditionally called conversation? The busy Adrastus, whose professional engagements might seem more than enough for the nervous energy of one man, and who yet finds time to print essays on the chief current subjects from the trilingual inscriptions or the idea of the infinite among the prehistoric laps, to the Colorado beetle and the grape disease in the south of France, is generally praised if not admired for the breadth of his mental range and his gigantic powers of work. Poor Theron, who has some original ideas on a subject to which he has given years of research and meditation, has been waiting anxiously from month to month to see whether his condensed exposition will find a place in the next advertised program, but sees it, on the contrary, regularly excluded, and twice the space he asked for filled with the copious brew of Adrastus, whose name carries custom like a celebrated trademark. Why should the eager haste to tell what he thinks on the shortest notice, as if his opinion were a needed preliminary to discussion, get a man the reputation of being a conceited bore in conversation, when nobody blames the same tendency if it shows itself in print? The excessive talker can only be in one gathering at a time, and there is the comfort of thinking that everywhere else other fellow citizens who have something to say may get a chance of delivering themselves. But the exorbitant writer can occupy space and spread over it the more or less agreeable flavor of his mind in four mediums at once, and on subjects taken from the four winds. Such restless and versatile occupants of literary space and time should have lived earlier when the world wanted summaries of all extant knowledge, and this knowledge being small, there was the more room for commentary and conjecture. They might have played the part of an Isidore of Seville or a Vincent of Beauvais brilliantly, and the willingness to write everything themselves would have been strictly in place. In the present day, the busy retailer of other people's knowledge which he has spoiled in the handling, the restless guesser and commentator, the importunate hawker of undesirable superfluities, the everlasting world compeller who rises early in the morning to praise what the world has already glorified, or makes himself haggard at night in writing out his descent from what nobody ever believed is not simply gratis an helens multa angendo nihil agens. He is an obstruction. Like an incompetent architect with too much interest at his back, he obtrudes his ill-considered work where place ought to have been left to better men. Is it out of the question that we should entertain some scruple about mixing our own flavor as of the too cheap and insistent nutmeg with that of every great writer and every great subject, especially when our flavor is all we have to give, the matter or knowledge having been already given by someone else. 
What if we were only like the Spanish wineskins, which impress the innocent stranger with the notion that the Spanish grape has naturally a taste of leather? One could wish that even the greatest minds should leave some themes unhandled, or at least leave us no more than a paragraph or two on them to show how well they did in not being more lengthy. Such entertainment of scruple can hardly be expected from the young, but happily their readiness to mirror the universe anew for the rest of mankind is not encouraged by easy publicity. In the vivacious Pepin I have often seen the image of my own early youth, when it seemed to me astonishing that the philosophers had left so many difficulties unsolved, and that so many great themes had raised no great poet to treat them. I had an elated sense that I should find my brain full of theoretic clues when I looked for them, and that whenever a poet had not done what I expected, it was for want of my insight. Not knowing what had been said about the play of Romeo and Juliet, I felt myself capable of writing something original on its blemishes and beauties. In relation to all subjects, I had a joyous consciousness of that ability which is prior to knowledge, and of only needing to apply myself in order to master any task, to conciliate philosophers whose systems were at present but dimly known to me, to estimate foreign poets whom I had not yet read to show up mistakes in an historic monograph that roused my interest in an epoch which I had been hitherto ignorant of, when I should once have had time to verify my views of probability by looking at an encyclopedia. So, Pepin, save only that he is industrious while I was idle. Like the astronomer in Rasselas, I swayed the universe in my consciousness without making any difference outside me whereas Pepin, while feeling himself powerful with the stars in their courses, really raises some dust here below. He is no longer in his springtide, but having been always busy, he has been obliged to use his first impressions as if they were deliberate opinions, and to range himself on the corresponding side in ignorance of much that he commits himself to, so that he retains some characteristics of a comparatively tender age, and among them a certain surprise that there have not been more persons equal to himself. Perhaps it is unfortunate for him that he early gained a hearing, or at least a place in print, and was thus encouraged in acquiring a fixed habit of writing to the exclusion of any other bread-winning pursuit. He is already to be classed as a general writer, corresponding to the comprehensive wants of the general reader, and with this industry on his hands, it is not enough for him to keep up the ingenuous self-reliance of youth. He finds himself under an obligation to be skilled in various methods of seeming to know, and having habitually expressed himself before he was convinced, his interest in all subjects is chiefly to ascertain that he has not made a mistake, and to feel his infallibility confirmed. That impulse to decide, that vague sense of being able to achieve the unattempted, that dream of aerial, unlimited movement at will, without feet or wings, which were once but the joyous mounting of young sap, are already taking shape as unalterable woody fibre. The impulse has hardened into style, and into a pattern of peremptory sentences. The sense of ability in the presence of other men's failures is turning into the official arrogance of one who habitually issues directions which he has never himself been called to execute. The dreamy buoyancy of the stripling has taken on a fatal sort of reality in written pretensions which carry consequences. He is on the way to become like the loud buzzing bouncing bombus who combines conceited illusions enough to supply several patients in a lunatic asylum with the freedom to show himself at large in various forms of print. If one who takes himself for the telegraphic centre of all American wires is to be confined as unfit to transact affairs, what shall we say to the man who believes himself in possession of the unexpressed motives and designs dwelling in the breasts of all sovereigns and all politicians? And I grieve to think that poor Pepin, though less political, may by and by manifest a persuasion hardly more sane, for he is beginning to explain people's writing by what he does not know about them. 
yet he was once at the comparatively innocent stage which i have confessed to be that of my own early astonishment at my powerful originality and copying the just humility of the old puritan i may say but for the grace of discouragement this coxcombry might have been mine pepin made for himself a necessity of writing and getting printed before he had considered whether he had the knowledge or belief that would furnish eligible matter at first perhaps the necessity galled him a little but it is now as easily born nay is as impressible a habit as the outpouring of inconsiderate talk he is gradually being condemned to have no genuine impressions no direct consciousness of enjoyment or the reverse from the quality of what is before him his perceptions are continually arranging themselves in forms suitable to a printed judgment and hence they will often turn out to be as much to the purpose if they are written without any direct contemplation of the object and are guided by a few external conditions which serve to classify it for him in this way he is irrevocably losing the faculty of accurate mental vision having bound himself to express judgments which will satisfy some other demands than that of veracity he has blunted his perceptions by continual preoccupation we cannot command veracity at will the power of seeing and reporting truly is a form of health that is to be delicately guarded and as an ancient rabbi has solemnly said the penalty of untruth is untruth but pepin is only a mild example of the fact that incessant writing with a view to printing carries internal consequences which have often the nature of disease and however unpractical it may be to consider whether we have anything to print which it is good for the world to read or which has not been better said before it will perhaps be allowed to be worth considering what effect the printing might have on ourselves clearly there is a sort of writing which helps to keep the writer in a ridiculously contented ignorance raising in him continually the sense of having delivered himself effectively so that the acquirement of more thorough knowledge seems as superfluous as the purchase of a costume for a past occasion he has invested his vanity perhaps his hope of income in his own shallowness and mistakes and must desire their prosperity like the professional prophet he learns to be glad of the harm that keeps up his credit and to be sorry for the good that contradicts him it is hard enough for any of us amid the changing winds of fortune and the hurly-burly of events to keep quite clear of a gladness which is another's calamity but one may choose not to enter on a course which will turn such gladness into a fixed habit of mind committing ourselves to be continually pleased that others should appear to be wrong in order that we may have the air of being right in some cases perhaps it might be urged that pepin has remained the more self-contented because he has not written everything he believed himself capable of he once asked me to read a sort of programme of the species of romance which he should think it worth while to write a species which he contrasted in strong terms with the productions of illustrious but overrated authors in this branch pepin's romance was to present the splendours of the roman empire at the culmination of its grandeur when decadence was spiritually but not visibly imminent it was to show the workings of human passion in the most pregnant and exalted of human circumstances the designs of statesmen the interfusion of philosophies the rural relaxation and converse of immortal poets the majestic triumphs of warriors the mingling of the quaint and sublime in religious ceremony the gorgeous delirium of gladiatorial shows and under all the secretly working leaven of christianity such a romance would not call the attention of society to the dialect of stable boys the low habits of rustics the vulgarity of small schoolmasters the manners of men in livery or to any other form of uneducated talk and sentiments its characteristics would have virtues and vices alike on the grand scale and would express themselves in an english representing the discourse of the most powerful minds in the best latin or possibly greek when there occurred a scene with a greek philosopher on a visit to rome or resident there as a teacher in this way pepin would do in fiction what had never been done before something not at all like rienzi or notre dame de paris or any other attempt of that kind 
but something at once more penetrating and more magnificent, more passionate and more philosophical, more panoramic yet more select, something that would present a conception of a gigantic period, in short, something truly Roman and world-historical. When Pepin gave me this program to read, he was much younger than at present. Some slight success in another vein diverted him from the production of panoramic and select romance, and the experience of not having tried to carry out his program has naturally made him more biting and sarcastic on the failures of those who have actually written romances, without apparently having had a glimpse of a conception equal to his. Indeed, I am often comparing his rather touchingly inflated naivety as of a small young person walking on tiptoe while he is talking of elevated things, at the time when he himself felt the author of that unwritten romance with his present epigrammatic curtness and affectation of power kept strictly in reserve. His paragraphs now seem to have a bitter smile in them from the consciousness of a mind too penetrating to accept any other man's ideas and too equally competent in all directions to seclude his power in any one form of creation, but rather fitted to hang over them all as a lamp of guidance to the stumblers below. You perceive how proud he is of not being indebted to any writer, even with the dead he is on the creditor's side, for he is doing them the service of letting the world know what they meant better than those poor pre-Papinians themselves had any means of doing, and he treats the mighty shades very cavalierly. Is this fellow, citizen of ours, considered simply in the light of a baptized Christian and tax-paying Englishman, really as madly conceited, as empty of reverential feeling, as unveracious and careless of justice, as full of catchpenny devices and strategy attitudinizing, as on examination his writing shows itself to be? By no means. He has arrived at his present pass in the literary calling through the self-imposed obligation to give himself a manner which would convey the impression of superior knowledge and ability. He is much worthier and more admirable than his written productions because the moral aspects exhibited in his writing are felt to be ridiculous or disgraceful in the personal relations of life. In blaming Pepin's writing, we are accusing the public conscience which is so lax and ill-informed on the momentous bearings of authorship that it sanctions the total absence of scruple in undertaking and prosecuting what should be the best warranted of vocations. Hence I still accept friendly relations with Pepin, for he has much private amiability, and though he probably thinks of me as a man of slender talents, without rapidity of coup d'oeil, and with no compensatory penetration, he meets me very cordially, and would not, I am sure, willingly pain me in conversation by crudely declaring his low estimate of my capacity. Yet I have often known him to insult my betters and contribute, perhaps unreflectingly, to encourage injurious conceptions of them. But that was done in the course of his professional writing, and then the public conscience still leaves such writing nearly at the level of the Mary Andrews dress which permits an impudent deportment and extraordinary gambles to one who in his ordinary clothing shows himself the decent father of a family. End of chapter 14. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 of Theophrastus Such by George Eliot. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Josh Middledorf. Chapter 15 Diseases of Small Authorship. Particular callings, it is known, encourage particular diseases. There is a painter's colic. The Sheffield grinder falls a victim to the inhalation of steel dust. Clergymen so often have a certain kind of sore throat that this otherwise secular ailment gets named after them. And perhaps, if we were to inquire, we should find a certain relation between certain moral ailments and these various occupations. Though here, in the case of clergymen, there would be specific differences. The poor curate, equally with the rector, is liable to clergyman's sore throat, but he would probably be found free from the chronic moral ailments encouraged by the possession of glebe 
and those higher chances of preferment which follow on having a good position already on the other hand the poor curate might have severe attacks of calculating expectancy concerning parishioners turkeys cheeses and fat geese or of uneasy rivalry for the donations of clerical charities authors are so miscellaneous a class that their personified diseases physical and moral might include the whole procession of human disorders led by dyspepsia and ending in madness the awful dumb show of a world historic tragedy take a large enough area of human life and all comedy melts into tragedy like the fool's part by the side of lear the chief scenes get filled with erring heroes guileful usurpers persecuted discoverers dying deliverers everywhere the protagonist has a part pregnant with doom the comedy sinks to an accessory and if there are loud laughs they seem a convulsive transition from sobs or if the comedy is touched with a gentle lovingness the panoramic scene is one where sadness is a kind of mirth so mingled as if mirth did make us sad and sadness merry that's a quote from two noble kinsmen but i did not set out on the wide survey that would carry me into tragedy and in fact had nothing more serious in mind than certain small chronic ailments that come of small authorship i was thinking principally of Vorticella, who flourished in my youth not only as a portly lady walking in silk attire but also as the authoress of a book entitled the channel islands with notes and an appendix i would by no means make it a reproach to her that she wrote no more than one book on the contrary her stopping there seemed to me a laudable example what one would have wished after experience was that she had refrained from producing even that single volume and thus from giving her self-importance a troublesome kind of double incorporation which became oppressive to her acquaintances and set up in herself one of those slight chronic forms of disease to which i have just referred she lived in the considerable provincial town of pumpeter which had its own newspaper press with the usual divisions of political partisanship and the usual varieties of literary criticism the florid and the elusive the staccato and the peremptory the clairvoyant and prophetic the safe and pattern phrased or what one might call the many a long day style porticella being the wife of an important townsman had naturally the satisfaction of seeing the channel islands reviewed by all the organs of pompiter opinion and their articles or paragraphs held as naturally the opening pages in the elegantly bound album prepared by her for the reception of critical opinions this ornamental volume lay on a special table in her drawing-room close to the still more gorgeously bound work of which it was the significant effect and every guest was allowed the privilege of reading what had been said of the authoress and her work in the Pumpeter Gazette and Literary Watchman, the Pumpshire Post, the Church Clock, the Independent Monitor, and the lively but judicious publication known as the Medley Pie, to be followed up, if he chose, by the instructive perusal of the strikingly confirmatory judgments, sometimes concurrent in their very phrase, of journals of the most distant counties as the Latchgate Argus, the Penlui Universe, the Kakaliki Advertiser, the Goodwin Sands Opinion, and Land's End Times. I had friends in Pupiter and occasionally paid a long visit there. When I called on Vorticella, who had a cousinship with my hosts, she had to excuse herself because a message claimed her attention for eight to ten minutes and handing me the album of critical opinions said with a certain emphasis which considering my youth was highly complimentary that she would really like me to read what i should find there this seemed a permissive politeness which i could not feel to be an oppression and i ran my eyes over the dozen pages each with a strip or eyelet of newspaper in the centre with that freedom of mind in my case meaning freedom to forget which would be a perilous way of preparing for examination 
the private truth being that I had not read the Channel Islands. I was amazed at the variety of matter which the volume must contain to have impressed these different judges with the writer's surpassing capacity to handle almost all branches of inquiry and all forms of presentation. In Jersey, she had shown herself an historian. In Guernsey, a poetess. In Alderney, a political economist. And in Sark, a humorist. There were sketches of character scattered through the pages which might put our fictionists to the blush. The style was eloquent and racy, studied with gems of felicitous remark. And the moral spirit throughout was so superior that, said one, the recording angel, who was not supposed to take account of literature as such, would assuredly set down the work as a deed of religion. The force of this eulogy on the part of several reviewers was much heightened by the incidental evidence of their fastidious and severe taste, which seemed to suffer considerably from the imperfections of our chief writers, even the dead and canonized. One afflicted them with the smell of oil, another lacked erudition, and attempted, though vainly, to dazzle them with trivial conceits. One wanted to be more philosophical than nature had made him. Another, in attempting to be comic, produced the melancholy effect of a half-starved Mary Andrew, while one and all, from the author of the Areopagitica downwards, had faults of style which must have made an able hand in the latchgate Argus shake the many glanced heads belonging thereto with a smile of compassionate disapproval. Not so the authoress of the Channel Islands, Vorticella and Shakespeare were allowed to be faultless. I gathered that no blemishes were observable in the work of this accomplished writer, and the repeated information that she was second to none seemed after this superfluous. Her thick octavo, notes, appendix, and all, was unflagging from beginning to end, and the Land's End Times, using a rather dangerous rhetorical figure, recommended you not to take up the volume unless you had leisure to finish it at a sitting. It had given one writer more pleasure than he had had for many a long day, a sentence which had a melancholy resonance, suggesting a life of studious languor, such as all previous achievements of the human mind failed to stimulate into enjoyment. I think the collection of critical opinions wound up with this sentence, and I had turned back to look at the lithographed text sketch of the authoress which fronted the first page of the album, when the fair original re-entered and I laid down the volume on its appropriate table. Well, what do you think of them? said Vorticella with an emphasis which had some significance unperceived by me. I know you are a great student. Give me your opinion of these opinions. They must have been very gratifying to you, I answered with a little confusion, for I perceived that I might easily mistake my footing and began to have a presentiment of an examination for which I was by no means crammed. On the whole, yes, said Vorticella in a tone of concession. A few of the notices are written with some pains, but not one of them has really grappled with the chief idea in the appendix. I don't know whether you have studied political economy, but you saw what I said on page 398 about the Jersey fisheries. I bowed, I confess it, with the mean hope that this movement in the nape of my neck would be taken as sufficient proof that I had read, marked, and learned. I do not forgive myself for this pantomimic falsehood, but I was young and morally timorous, and Vorticella's personality had an effect on me, something like that of a powerful mesmerizer when he directs all his ten fingers toward your eyes, as unpleasantly visible ducts for the invisible stream. I felt a great power of contempt in her if I did not come up to her expectations. Well, she resumed, you observe that not one of them has taken up that argument. But I hope I convinced you about the dragnets. Here was a judgment on me. Orientally speaking, I had lifted up my foot on the steep descent of falsity and was compelled to set it down on a lower level. I should think you must be right, said I, inwardly resolving that on the next topic I would tell the truth. 
I know that I am right, said Vorticella. The fact is that no critic in this town is fit to meddle with such subjects, unless it be Volvox, and he, with all his command of language, is very superficial. It is Volvox who writes in the monitor. I hope you noticed how he contradicts himself. My resolution, helped by the equivalence of dangers, stoutly prevailed, and I said, No. No? I am surprised. He is the only one who finds fault with me. He is a dissenter, you know. The monitor is the dissenter's organ, but my husband has been so useful to them in municipal affairs that they would not venture to run my book down. They feel obliged to tell the truth about me. Still, Baldvox betrays himself. After praising me for my penetration and accuracy, he presently says, I have allowed myself to be imposed upon and have let my active imagination run away with me. That is like his dissenting impertinence. Active my imagination may be, but I have it under control. Little Vibrio, who writes the playful notice in the medley pie, has a clever hit at Volvox in that passage about the steeplechase of imagination, where the loser wants to make it appear that the winner has only run away with. But if you did not notice Volvox's self-contradiction, you would not see the point, added Vorticella with rather a chilling intonation. Or perhaps you did not read the medley pie notice. That is a pity. Do take up the book again. Vibrio is a poor little tippling creature, but, as Miss Carlyle would say, he has an eye, and he is always lively. I did take up the book again, and read as demanded. It is very ingenious, said I, really appreciating the difficulty of being lively in this connection. It seemed even more wonderful than that a vibrio should have an eye. You were probably surprised to see no notices from the London press, said Vorticella. I have one, a very remarkable one, but I reserved it until the others have spoken, and then I shall introduce it to wind up. I shall have them reprinted, of course, and inserted in future copies. This from the Calendabrum is only eight lines in length, but full of venom. It calls my style dull and pompous. I think that will tell its own tale, placed after the other critiques. People's impressions are so different, said I. Some persons find Don Quixote dull. Yes, said Vorticella in emphatic chest tones. Dullness is a matter of opinion. But pompous, that I never was and never could be. Perhaps he means that my matter is too important for his taste. And I have no objection to that. I did not intend to be trivial. I should just like you to read that passage about the dragnets, because I could make it clearer to you. A second, less ornamental copy was at her elbow and was already opened, when, to my great relief, another guest was announced, and I was able to take my leave without seeming to run away from the Channel Islands though not without being compelled to carry with me the loan of the marked copy, which I was to find advantageous in a re-perusal of the appendix, and was only requested to return before my departure from Pumpeter. Looking into the volume now with some curiosity, I found it a very ordinary combination of the commonplace and ambitious, one of those books which one might imagine to have been written under the old Grub Street coercion of hunger and thirst, if they were not known beforehand to be the gratuitous production of ladies and gentlemen, whose circumstances might be called altogether easy, but for an uneasy vanity that happened to have been directed towards authorship, its importance was that of a polypus, tumor, fungus, or other erratic outgrowth, noxious and disfiguring in its effect on the individual organism which nourishes it, Poor Verticella might not have been more wearisome on a visit than the majority of her neighbors, but for this disease of magnified self-importance belonging to small authorship. I understand that the chronic complaint of the Channel Islands never left her. As the years went on, and the publication tended to vanish in the distance for her neighbor's memory, she was still bent on dragging it to the foreground, and her chief interest in new acquaintances was the possibility of lending them her book, entering into all details concerning it and requesting them to read her album of critical opinions. 
This really made her more tiresome than Gregorina, whose distinction was that she had a cholera, and who did not feel herself in her true position with strangers until they knew it. My experience with Vorticella led me for a time into the false supposition that this sort of fungus disfiguration, which makes self disagreeably larger, was most common to the female sex. But I presently found that here too the male could assert his superiority and show a more vigorous boredom. I have known a man with a single pamphlet containing an assurance that somebody else was wrong, together with a few approved quotations, produce a more powerful effect of shuddering at his approach than ever Vorticella did with her varied octavo volume, including notes and appendix. Males of more than one nation recur to my memory who produced from their pocket on the slightest encouragement a small pink or buff duodecimo pamphlet wrapped in silver paper as a present held ready for an intelligent reader. A mode of propagandism, you remark in excuse, they wish to spread some useful corrective doctrine. Not necessarily. The indoctrination aimed at was perhaps to convince you of their own talents by the sample of an ode on Shakespeare's birthday or a translation from Horace. Vorticella may pair off with Monas, who had also written his one book, Here and There, or A Trip from Truro to Transylvania and not only carried it in his portmanteau when he went on visits, but took the earliest opportunity of depositing it in the drawing-room, and afterwards would enter to look for it, as if under pressure of a need for reference, begging the lady of the house to tell him whether she had seen a small volume bound in red. One hostess at last ordered it to be carried into his bedroom, to save his time, but it presently reappeared in his hands and was again left with inserted slips of paper on the drawing-room table. Depend upon it, vanity is human, native alike to men and women, only in the male it is of a denser texture, less volatile, so that it less immediately informs you of its presence, but is more massive and capable of knocking you down if you come into collision with it. While in women vanity lays by its small revenges, as in a needle case always at hand. The difference is in muscle and fingertips, in traditional habits and mental perspective, rather than in the original appetite of vanity. It is an approved method now to explain ourselves by a reference to the races as little like us as possible, which leads me to observe that in Fiji the men use the most elaborate hairdressing, and that wherever tattooing is in vogue, the male ex expects to carry off the prize of admiration for pattern and workmanship. Arguing analogically, and looking for this tendency of the Fijian or Hawaiian male in the eminent European, we must suppose that it exhibits itself under the form of civilized apparel, and it would be a great mistake to estimate passionate effort by the effect it produces on our perception or understanding. It is conceivable that a man may have concentrated no less will and expectation on his wristbands, gaiters, and the shape of his hat brim, or an appearance which impresses you as that of the modern swell, than the Ojibwe on an ornamentation which seems to us much more elaborate. In what concerns the search for admiration, at least, it is not true that the effect is equal to the cause and resembles it. The cause of a flat curl on the masculine forehead, such as might have been seen when George the Fourth was king, must have been widely different in quality and intensity from the impression made by that small scroll of hair on the organ of the beholder. Merely to maintain an attitude and gait which I notice in certain club men, and especially an inflation of the chest accompanying very small remarks, there goes, I am convinced, an expenditure of physical energy little appreciated by the multitude, a mental vision of self and deeply impressed beholders, which is quite without antitype in what we call the effect produced by that hidden process. No, there is no need to admit that women would carry away the prize of vanity in a competition where differences of custom were fairly considered. A man cannot show his vanity in a tight skirt, which forces him to walk sideways down the staircase, but let the match be between the respective vanities of largest beard and tightest skirt, 
and here too the battle would be to the strong. End of chapter 15. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 of Theophrastus Such by George Eliot. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Josh Middledorf. Chapter 16 Moral Swindlers. It is a familiar irony in the degradation of words that what a man is worth has come to mean how much money he possesses. But there seems to be a deeper and more melancholy irony in the shrunken meaning that popular or polite speech assigns to morality and morals. The poor part these words are made to play recalls the fate of those pagan divinities who, after being understood to rule the powers of the air and the destinies of men, came down to the level of insignificant demons, or even made a farcical show for the amusement of the multitude. Talking to Melissa in a time of commercial trouble, I found her disposed to speak pathetically of the disgrace which had fallen on Sir Gavriel Mantrap because of his conduct in relation to the Eocene mines, and to other companies ingeniously devised by him for the punishment of ignorance in people of small means a disgrace by which the poor, titled gentleman was actually reduced to live in comparative obscurity on his wife's settlement of one or two hundred thousand in the consuls. "'Surely your pity is misapplied,' said I, rather dubiously, for I like the comfort of trusting that a correct moral judgment is the strong point in women, seeing that she has a majority of about a million in our islands.' and I imagine that Melissa might have some unexpressed grounds for her opinion. I should have thought you would rather be sorry for Mantrap's victims, the widows, spinsters, and hard-working fathers whom his unscrupulous haste to make himself rich has cheated of all their savings, while he is eating well, lying softly, and after impudently justifying himself before the public, is perhaps joining in the general confession with a sense that he is an acceptable object in the sight of God, though decent men refuse to meet him. Oh, all that about the companies, I know, was most unfortunate. In commerce people are led to do so many things, and he might not know exactly how everything would turn out. But Sir Gaviel made a good use of his money, and he is a thoroughly moral man. What do you mean by a thoroughly moral man? said I. Oh, I suppose everyone means the same by that, said Melissa, with a slight air of rebuke. Sir Gaviel is an excellent family man, quite blameless there, and so charitable round his place at Tip Top, very different from Mr. Barabbas, whose life, my husband tells me, is most objectionable with actresses and that sort of thing. I think a man's morals should make a difference to us. I'm not sorry for Mr. Barabbas, but I am sorry for Gabriel Mantrap. I will not repeat my answer to Melissa, for I fear it was offensively brusque, my opinion being that Sir Gabriel was the more pernicious scoundrel of the two, since his name for virtue served as an effective part of a swindling apparatus, and perhaps I hinted that to call such a man moral showed rather a silly notion of human affairs. In fact, I had an angry wish to be instructive, and Melissa, as will sometimes happen, noticed my anger without appropriating my instruction, for I have since heard that she speaks of me as rather violent-tempered and not over-strict in my views of morality. I wish that this narrow use of words which are wanted in their full meaning were confined to women like Melissa. Seeing that morality and morals under their alias of ethics were the subject of voluminous discussion and their true basis a pressing matter of dispute, seeing that the most famous book ever written on ethics and forming a chief study in our colleges allies ethical with political science or that which treats of the constitution and prosperity of states, one might expect that educated men would find reason to avoid a perversion of language 
which lends itself to no wider view of life than that of a village gossip. Yet I find even respectable historians of our own and foreign countries, after showing that a king was treacherous, rapacious, and ready to sanction gross breaches in the administration of justice, end by praising him for his pure moral character, by which one must suppose them to mean that he was not lewd or debauched, not the European twin of the typical Indian potentate, whom Macaulay describes as passing his life in chewing bang and fondling dancing girls. And since we are sometimes told of such maleficent kings that they were religious, we arrive at the curious result that the most serious, wide-reaching duties of man lie quite outside both morality and religion, the one of these consisting in not keeping mistresses and perhaps not drinking too much, and the other in certain ritual and spiritual transactions with God, which can be carried on equally well side by side with the basest conduct toward men. With such a classification as this, it is no wonder, considering the strong reaction of language on thought, that many minds, dizzy with indigestion of recent science and philosophy, are far to seek from the grounds of social duty, and without entertaining any private intention of committing a perjury which would ruin an innocent man, or seeking gain by supplying bad preserved meats to our navy, feel themselves speculatively obliged to inquire why they should not do so, and are inclined to measure their intellectual subtlety by their dissatisfaction with all answers to this why. It is of little use to theorize in ethics, while our habitual phraseology stamps the larger part of our social duties as something that lies aloof from the deepest needs and affections of our nature. The informal definitions of popular language are the only medium through which theory really affects the mass of minds, even among the nominally educated. And when a man whose business hours, the solid part of every day, are spent in an unscrupulous course of public or private action, which has every calculable chance of causing widespread injury and misery, can yet be called moral because he comes home to dine with his wife and children and cherishes the happiness of his own hearth. The augury is not good for the use of high ethical and theological disputation. Not for one moment would one willingly lose sight of the truth that the relation of the sexes and the primary ties of kinship are the deepest roots of human well-being. But to make them by themselves the equivalent of morality is verbally to cut off the channels of feeling through which they are the feeders of that well-being. They are the original fountains of a sensibility to the claims of others, which is the bond of societies. But being necessarily, in the first instance, a private good, there is always the danger that individual selfishness will see in them only the best part of its own gain. Just as knowledge, navigation, commerce, and all the conditions which are of a nature to awaken men's consciousness of their mutual dependence, and to make the world one great society, are the occasions of selfish, unfair action, of war and oppression, so long as the public conscience or chief force of feeling and opinion is not uniform and strong enough in its insistence on what is demanded by the general welfare and among the influences that must retard a right public judgment, the degradation of words which involve praise and blame will be reckoned worth protesting against by every mature observer. To rob words of half their meaning while they retain their dignity as qualifications is like allowing to men who have lost half their faculties the same high and perilous command which they won in their time of vigor or like selling food and seeds after fraudulently abstracting their best virtues. In each case, what ought to be beneficently strong is fatally enfeebled, if not empoisoned. Until we have altered our dictionaries and have found some other word than morality to stand in popular use for the duties of man to man, let us refuse to accept as moral the contractor who enriches himself by using large machinery to make pasteboard soles pass as leather for the feet of unhappy conscripts fighting at miserable odds against invaders. 
let us rather call him a miscreant though he were the tenderest most faithful of husbands and contend that his own experience of home happiness makes his reckless infliction of suffering on others all the more atrocious let us refuse to accept as moral any political leader who should allow his conduct in relation to great issues to be determined by egoistic passion and boldly say that he would be less immoral even though he were as lax in his personal habits as sir robert walpole if at the same time his sense of the public welfare were supreme in his mind quelling all pettier impulses beneath a magnanimous impartiality and though we were to find among that class of journalists who live by recklessly reporting injurious rumours insinuating the blackest motives in opponents descanting at large and with an air of infallibility on dreams which they both find and interpret and stimulating bad feeling between nations by abusive writing which is as empty of real conviction as the rage of a pantomime king and would be ludicrous if its effect did not make it appear diabolical though we were to find among these a man who was benignancy itself in his own circle a healer of private differences a soother in private calamities let us pronounce him nevertheless flagrantly immoral a root of hideous cancer in the commonwealth turning the channels of instruction into feeders of social and political disease in opposite ways one sees bad effects likely to be encouraged by this narrow use of the word morals shutting out from its meaning half those actions of a man's life which tell momentously on the well-being of his fellow citizens and on the preparation of a future for the children growing up around him thoroughness of workmanship care in the execution of every task undertaken as if it were the acceptance of a trust which it would be a breach of faith not to discharge well is a form of duty so momentous that if it were to die out from the feeling and practice of a people all reforms of institutions would be helpless to create national prosperity and national happiness do we desire to see public spirit penetrating all classes of the community and affecting every man's conduct so that he shall make neither the saving of his soul nor any other private saving an excuse for indifference to the general welfare well and good but the sort of public spirit that scamps its bread-winning work whether with the trowel the pen or the overseeing brain that it may hurry to scenes of political or social agitation would be as baleful a gift to our people as any malignant demon could devise one best part of educational training is that which comes through special knowledge and manipulative or other skill with its usual accompaniment of delight in relation to work which is the daily bread-winning occupation which is a man's contribution to the effective wealth of society in return for what he takes as his own share but this duty of doing one's proper work well and taking care that every product of one's labour shall be genuinely what it pretends to be is not only left out of morals in popular speech it is very little insisted on by public teachers at least in the only effective way by tracing the continuous effects of ill-done work some of them seem to be still hopeful that it will follow as a necessary consequence from weekday services ecclesiastical decoration and improved hymn-books others apparently trust to descanting on self-culture in general or to raising a general sense of faulty circumstances and meanwhile lax makeshift work from the high conspicuous kind to the average and obscure is allowed to pass unstamped with the disgrace of immorality though there is not a member of society who is not daily suffering from it materially and spiritually and though it is the fatal cause that must degrade our national rank and our commerce in spite of all open markets and discovery of available coal seams i suppose one may take the popular misuse of the words morality and morals as some excuse for certain absurdities which are occasional fashions in speech and writing certain old lay figures as ugly as the queerest asiatic idol 
which at different periods get propped into loftiness and attired in magnificent venetian drapery so that whether they have a human face or not is of little consequence one is the notion that there is a radical irreconcilable opposition between intellect and morality i do not mean the simplest statement of fact which every one knows that remarkably able men have had very faulty morals and have outraged public feeling even at its ordinary standard but the supposition that the ablest intellect the highest genius will see through morality as sort of twaddle for bibs and tuckers a doctrine of dullness a mere incidental in human stupidity we begin to understand the acceptance of this foolishness by considering that we live in a society where we may hear a treacherous monarch or a malignant and lying politician or a man who uses either official or literary power as an instrument of his private partiality or hatred or a manufacturer who devises the falsification of wares, or a trader who deals in virtueless seed grains, praised or compassioned because of his excellent morals. Clearly, if morality meant no more than such decencies as are practiced by these poisonous members of society, it would be possible to say without suspicion of light-headedness that morality lay aloof from the grand stream of human affairs, as a small channel fed by the stream and not missed from it. While this form of nonsense is conveyed in the public use of words, there must be plenty of well-dressed ignorance at leisure to run through a box of books, which will feel itself initiated in the Freemasonry of intellect by a view of life which might take for a Shakespearean motto, Fair is foul and foul fair, hover through the fog and filthy air and will find itself easily provided with striking conversation by the rule of reversing all the judgments on good and evil which have come to be the calendar and clockwork of society. But let our habitual talk give morals their full meaning, as the conduct which, in every human relation, would follow from the fullest knowledge and the fullest sympathy, a meaning perpetually corrected and enriched by a more thorough appreciation of dependence in things and a finer sensibility to both physical and spiritual fact and this ridiculous ascription of superlative power to minds which have no effective awe-inspiring vision of the human lot no response of understanding to the connection between duty and the material processes by which the world is kept habitable for cultivated men will be tacitly discredited without any need to cite the immortal names that all are obliged to take as the measure of intellectual rank and high-charged genius suppose a parisian who should shuffle down the boulevard with a soul ignorant of the gravest cares and the deepest tendernesses of mankind and a frame more or less fevered by debauchery mentally polishing into utmost refinement of phrase and rhythm verses which were an enlargement on that shakespearean motto and worthy of the most expensive title to be furnished by the vendors of such antithetic wares as les marguerites de l'enfer or les délices de bilzebout this supposed personage might probably enough regard his negation of these moral sensibilities which make half the warp and woof of human history his indifference to the hard thinking and hard handiwork of life to which he owed even his own gauzy mental garments with their spangles of poor paradox as the royalty of genius for we are used to witness such self-crowning in many forms of mental attention but he would not i think be taken even by his own generation as a living proof that there can exist such a combination as that of moral stupidity and trivial emphasis of personal indulgence with the large yet finely discriminating vision which marks the intellectual masters of our kind doubtless there are many sorts of transfiguration and a man who has come to be worthy of our gratitude and reverence may have had his swinish period wallowing in ugly places but suppose it had been handed down to us that sophocles or virgil had at one time made himself scandalous in this way the works which have consecrated their memory for our admiration and gratitude are not a glorifying of swinishness but an artistic incorporation of the highest sentiment known of their age 
All these may seem to be wide reasons for objecting to Melissa's pity for Sir Gavial Mantrap on the ground of his good morals, but their connection will not be obscure to anyone who has taken pains to observe the links uniting the scattered signs of our social development. End of chapter 16 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.